is up? What is up? What is up? It is your boy, RC Apologist, and you are live or here with Theological Discussion. And I'm your host. Oh, forget it. I already said who I am and... Hold on a second. Oi! Get away from the Cheetos! Sorry, we got... We got a mutated rat that's in the building. And yes, his name is Chester, if you would imagine so. And he's going after the Cheetos. We have to stop him at all times, so I keep empty water bottles on hand to keep him away because it is an eight-foot rat that loves Cheetos. Why not? Because they're Cheetos. Anyways, enough of the silly randomness. Besides, we are here. We have an interesting guest. Now, we've had our fair share of... Um, Yes, before that have been furries or members of the furry community. We've had the, all kinds. We've had people from Haven Fusky of Good Fur News and a couple of others uh, like Aaron Fox. Uh, and then all the way down to the controversial figures of even uh, Genesius Wolf and Foxler himself. Now we come to another one in the furry lineup of the guests that have come on to Theological Discussion. And if I'm not mistaken, then this would make it the fifth guest so i guess the five podcast furry anniversary or something i don't know but he is a, a well-known figure in the community he is the author of a comic book by the name uh, or a web comic by the name of house pets and i believe there's some other projects that he is uh, behind in the works um so i don't think there is um any need uh, for that much introduction other than saying welcome aboard Rick Griffin. Oh. Hello. And how do you feel? Uh, tired, mostly. Mm, same here. I just got done having to take care of my five-year-old nephew, and he drives me crazy. So, I say we're both tired a bit. So, let me ask you this. So, you, first of all, I guess the main question would be on some people's mind is, um, what got you into the furry community? Um, I've always been interested in anthropomorphic animals. Mm. Um, I, it's one of those things you can't really say why it is. Uh, right. Just growing up, I found animals to be more interesting than people, mostly because people tended to be terrible. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, as someone that is slightly antisocial i understand that uh premise sometimes i feel like i could get along more with um with a dog uh much more than i can a purse uh people sometimes um but that being said it's okay so you, you had a interest in anthropomorphic animals especially the animals itself in terms of that more than people so let's talk about then one of your con contributions in the fandom is um this comic, which I keep seeing on my Twitter feed occasionally, is people like sharing certain strips that get uh, brought about. Um, and it's, to me, kind of humorous with, uh, to me though, I don't know what happens most of the time. Like from what I read on the wiki, on the wiki fur page, it's like, um, a dis it's like an alternate reality kind of thing, but I just keep seeing a bathhouse and random shenanigans uh, nowadays and that so like what's the whole deal with the with the plot or what's 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 going on here what's going on right now or what's going on in general like just in general because i'm like confused for the most uh, part in, in general the premise of house pets i've described as what if garfield but you know for a fact that john can understand him oh. and i basically ended up making a world around that and then I kind of decided that was a little boring, so I went into a whole bunch of uh, supernatural shenanigans because that's just kind of fun and something that uh, made it a bit more uh, freer to write different kinds of things without having to fall back on just uh, pet drama or whatever it is that... <laughs> Because I am a very fickle person being an artist. Uh, sometimes I just feel like doing something completely different from time to time. So mm. I don't want to feel locked into any like one incredibly specific uh, kind of plot. I like the variety <laughs> that affords me. Right. So 
I know. I, so I want to touch on one thing then, because I noticed whenever I, because I tried to course with most most of my guests, I try to do research into matters, and when I um, saw your wiki for a page, they mentioned concer concerning the house pets uh, series that one of the inspirations of it was based off of uh, a certain pet you had. At least that's what was it? It's a. Uh, uh, the, the wikis always seem to make uh, things up. I it said uh, about a childhood, uh, childhood about a dog named Bino. Said that it was based. Uh, that, off that was based off a comic that I drew. Ah, yeah, because it said it was like sketches that you did. Yes, mm. because Bino is how it's pronounced. Because I didn't know how English orthography worked when I was very young. I just said that's how it's pronounced is Bino. Uh, <laughs> It was just basically uh, me redrawing Garfield strips until I decided I could do something original with this. And then I drew a couple original Bino strips. And eventually that just kind of got subsumed until uh, sometime around 2007 when I thought, you know, I want to make a webcomic that I can update three times a week. Because I had attempted doing web comics before, but uh, one of the ma major problems with them was uh, mm -hmm. I am very terrible at getting my scripts done ahead of time. But then I thought, well, a gag strip doesn't need to have anything done ahead of time. I can just sort of make it up as I go along. Mm -hmm. uh, if I just bring back that old stuff that I have with... Uh, interest in doing a gag strip like Garfield sort of as also based on like all the other uh, probably much better comics that I read as a child like uh, Calvin and Hobbes and Bloom County and things like that um, oh yeah good old Calvin and Hobbes yeah like if I could do that and that would make it easier because then I wouldn't necessarily have to pay attention to what I'm doing from the start all the way until the end. It's like, I can just get practice in updating something three times a week. That's all I have to do. And I don't have to worry about it until I started worrying about it. And um, that started resulting in very much longer plot lines, <laughs> <laughs> which I mean, always happens, always seems to happen with, with web comics. If you see a lot of them, they start out gag a day and then they get super serious. And that's exactly what I did. I got super serious, but I tried to get super serious in a way where it's still funny. And right. like, I, I can see that, like, I don't want to name names and most people probably wouldn't recognize the names I'd name anyway, because those would be comics from the early two thousands. But, uh, some of them, when they start doing the serious plot line, they kind of stop being the comic that they used to be. And I, I also, I understand that comics evolve, but there's also kind of like, an evolution whiplash that <laughs> it might undergo if you're silly all the time and all of a sudden it's very taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, uh, I've, I've noticed that some comics have tried doing that before. Um, like I remember like, what was it? Uh, like, I think it's, what's it? Uh, I think want to say Archie or something like that. Um, had, yeah, Archie, Archie's done it like a dozen times, I'm pretty sure. Exactly, because the only <laughs> one that I remember seeing or hearing about was the one where Archie gets shot. Um, spoiler alert, by the way, for those that have been listening and <laughs> decided to lit, read Archie. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, that, as far as what I thought, it was like an old like comic that's supposed to be fun, comedy, slice of life kind of stuff that you'd expect. Basically, like if the... Um, Andy Griffith show was in a comic book format. Like to me, it had that kind of feel and like the setting and the style and everything, except now it's kind of dealing with kids, of course. But that being said, I mean, it's, it, you don't expect gruesome like incidents like that or serious topics until they, cr they come across that road. Um, but I don't know. Sometimes I think that 
it depends on how you go about it that you would mm-hmm. um, like it depending on how you do the execution mm-hmm. then people will like it and will continue wanting to read it because I tend to notice that it seems that that's what's going on with your comics is because I keep getting spammed with re- some some of my followers and people that I follow retweeting it and I'm like whoa my goodness what is what is all this stuff here so it's it's definitely had an impact I would say um, but I would uh, agree I'm, yeah it depends like some comics have done it before and hasn't done well either. yeah and I also would not definitely would not claim that I actually know what I'm doing um, <laughs> because I clearly don't. Uh, and like I said, I just started this format so that I could ch- kind of make it up as I go along. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a result of this, right. I have started working on other stories and comic projects where I try and implement what I've learned instead of just kind of making up what, as I go along. And, uh, you know, some people prefer that. Some people just prefer house pets because it's something that I've been doing for a decade and they already know what it is. I mean, there's, there's not really going to be like any definitive way to do it. Like maybe somewhat, and the way that I've done it isn't necessarily the best way to do it, especially since making up as I go along has put me in very weird positions. <laughs> I have to resolve uh, certain plot lines that I suddenly realize that I don't really have a desire to do this right now, but I got to do it anyway. <laughs> mm. Like the right. so house pets is sort of like a series of putting myself into a difficult position on purpose and then seeing if I can write my way out of it. <laughs> But you managed to do it, though, do you? Yeah, apparently. Uh, people <laughs> like it. I guess that counts. <laughs> but they're like, well, we want to. S- they want to see the results of you suffering. Is essentially then what that is. Then I yes. Guess. Well, I mean, all artists suffer to some extent. The only artists who don't actually suffer are the ones that. Uh, probably the ones that get paid the most, but other than that is probably the ones that uh, <laughs> don't share their art at all because then you don't have to worry what anyone else thinks. <laughs> right. Well, it's definitely good to see that uh, you're doing successful with that and that uh, you've had an impact there in the furry community. Um, so I'm definitely going to try to tune into that. And uh, who knows, maybe like I'll uh, follow on Twitter or however it is I can subscribe and be informed of when like more of the strips come along um so thank you for that um so so now we're going to get into something that um is what i would say i guess the saucy part because like it's said, like i says with the title of the show you can't have an episode of theological discussion if we don't find a way to put the theological discussion in it i almost went bill cosby Impersonation, old school for a second. I don't know why. It's probably part, at least the Southern in me. I have no, okay, I'm going to stop before I do it again. Okay, let's, let's just try to get, go on, do it. All right, so the, the topic um, that I want to cover, uh, there was something that was pointed to me by a fan of mine um, in regards um, to something that I guess y'all had a discussion or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I took a look at the tweet thread that you had started on it and, you know, I had some things where obviously I disagree with some of the approaches that, um, this guy said towards you, but at the same time, I also found some things that I think were, uh, problematic or inconsistent with the statements that you have said. And I figured what better way than to have a conversation um on this to talk these things out not a twitter war or any like diss tracks i don't know i don't know about you but my rapping skills are terrible Mm. um so i I figured this would be a better way to go about this stuff so i want to just go over some of that stuff so like how what what brought about this was this just some random um conversation that got started up or 
was there any like background or story that led up to this pertaining at least to this uh, specific individual you the had specific on? individual no they messaged me out of the blue and said what is your justification for drawing adult artwork mm -hmm. and that's in the context of me being uh considering myself a christian and i gave them the answer and they wanted to say that's wrong you can't say that mm -hmm. and my position is well i can technically do whatever i want because these reasons <laughs> and it's like i was i was probably being a little snotty and dismissive towards him for particular a one particular reason being that I am very tired of having to justify myself in this regard because I've done it dozens of times. Um, so, but if you disagree with me, it's like, I absolutely understand. I mean, I, I probably don't articulate myself very well. Uh, my argumentation was very roughshod and uh, reactive to whatever he happened to say and my most immediate reaction towards it and that's not really a very sound uh, that's not really a very uh, sound defensive argument um, but it is one that I think mainly highlights the uh, problems of certain kinds of arguments that come up with uh, theology uh, mm -hmm. which I've always had a problem with and is basically the reason that I ended up uh, leaving the church that my parents go to. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, so... Yeah, curious, um, curious question, what church was that? Like, uh, uh, church of Christ. And, oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know what that is, but like a lot of yep. people don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> but basically... If, if you don't know what Church of Christ is, you probably haven't lived anywhere near Texas uh, or the rest of the South that's near around Texas. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Church of Christ, think Baptist, except uh, very, very uh, rules oriented when it comes to uh, interpreting the Bible. Mm -hmm. That as well as the their specific interpretation on the bap on a baptism required for salvation. Um, that would definitely be one thing that I had noticed, uh, especially with the church, uh, church of Christ in my particular area. So in fact, that was actually a controversy regarding the, the duck dynasty people, because people found out they attended a church of Christ denomination, but it sounded like they weren't even actually following the official doctrine. So it's like, that one moment they're trying to see if they can say, oh, do they affirm it? Well, they are half weighing it, so we can't figure out who. So yeah. anyone, could, anyone could take their shot at this point. <laughs> but yeah, so so what's... At, the, yeah, that's, that's like a lot of the troubles that come in when it came to the Church of Christ is that you, you even have a whiff of association of something that has been... Uh, immediately deemed bad, mm -hmm. like not even necessarily participating in it, just being somewhere near it, it can ruin your reputation in church. And it's really annoying and stupid. And that's not really something that I ever approved of or want to approve of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So just, just a reminder for the audience. So what was the main thing that, or that thing that made you leave the church? Besides the... Uh, the thing that actually made me leave my church is completely right. different from what was uh, stated in this argument. Uh -huh. So, um, a couple years ago, uh, I just started decided to start growing my hair long. Mm. And that was because uh, I was already in my 20s and my mom eventually just stopped saying, you need to go get a haircut. And I just decided you know what, I want to try wearing it long. Well, this is a particular Church of Christ that exists in the South, and they oh, don't boy. like that. They don't like, they didn't even like the fact that I tended to show up to church not wearing a uh, 
white collared shirt and tie, but wearing my hair long was a definite no-no. And they said, well, you can't go up front and do the song leading anymore, or you can't do, uh, you can't serve the communion anymore so long as you have ha your hair long. And I was sitting there like, that's hypocritical. I don't have to abide by anything that you say. And it's like, well, we're the elders of the church and we decide the policy here. And I'm like, okay. And eventually that was like, bye. Um, if they're going to, uh, if they're going to uh, make decrees that I don't think are biblically lawful uh, to try and restrict what I can do with myself and uh, my life, then I don't need to be a part of that church. Right. And it's like the moment that that starts infringing on me and something as completely innocuous as growing my hair long, mm -hmm. I just kind of stopped caring what they thought about anything. <laughs> Which makes me wonder, because obviously I disagree with uh, the modern image that's being put, or the, the image that's being usually popularly articulated, but makes you wonder, like, if they would have had a problem with Samson or Jesus. Uh, the that was brought up several times during the <laughs> arguments. I know my dad and my older brother argued on my behalf because I just didn't did not have like the patience to deal with them right <laughs> because the argument is yeah samson and jesus probably wore their hair long and you know what else jesus also wore sandals which i often did <laughs> wear wore sandals to church <laughs> exactly. yeah and they didn't like that because the proper image of a good christian is to wear Le uh, patent leather shoes, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, like, because to me, like, with our church, because uh, we've had a, that brought up one time during my pastor's sermon, is that, you know, we'll accept anyone, regardless if you are a fine dressed, uh, sharp dressed man in a suit or even uh, a hobo that's got, uh, like, only socks or even no shoes for that matter. And you just come in poorly dressed. Uh, you're equal in the family at that point, And we'll be happy to take care of you and treat you family as, you know, let you sit in the sermon, shake you, hug you and everything. We, we, it's like welcoming in that regard. And that's why to me, I think Southern Baptist is a, uh, <clears throat> a very good denomination to be a part of considering the, um, diversity in terms of not just uh, kinds of people, but even theological uh, beliefs from the Arminian to the Calvin Calvinists. Um, and that's such of a big split in theological interpretation um, are allowed to be in and even some to run for president of the convention conference itself. So as yeah, one thing, well, my, my church is, says that too and that was like another one of the problems i had i have like a huge laundry list i could nail up my own 95 theses to their door but yeah, there you go it's like they say well anyone is welcome here it doesn't matter you don't have to look a certain way and you know one day this uh man and uh his wife who are both covered in tattoos apollo no hold on my dog is barking at something outside uh, Go, came in with covered in tattoos and they were initially welcomed but uh, then came all the little micro bereavements you kind of need to cover up your tattoos because that makes some people uncomfortable and it's like tattoos are kind of a part of who he is at this point and besides there's not really anything unlawful about having tattoos either <laughs> I mean, there, there's some, there's some uh, verses that you can interpret as saying this means tattoos are bad, but that wasn't even part of church policy. They left that open to interpretation, and yet it's still a bad form to have tattoos in front of people because they might think that it's bad. 
Uh, well, I would understand where they would get that concept because it's talking about like some people, you know, tolerate certain thing. Well, basically, like Romans 14, and I believe it's mentioned as well in 1 Corinthians 6, where it's talking about that everything is, you know, uh, permissible, but not all things are beneficial as well as that some people may be stumbled by that. So I can understand as in like hiding, like preventing it from some people that may just be uncomfortable with it. Like for me and not a religious related issue, like I occasionally pop my fingers and have to crack them, but I have to stop whenever it comes to my, uh, my stepmom's grand, uh, mother who uh, has a very big problem with that stuff. And I can imagine why, uh, cause like not a lot of people like to hear the sound of bones, like popping out and everything It kind of, you know, sounds like something you'd hear in a horror movie when the zombies come out. But to me, I like the sound as well as I, sometimes I just need to let them loose, um, get the joints moving a bit. And, but I learned to try to respect some of that, but at the same time, I don't think that we need to make it too much of a dramatic thing concerning the tattoos as well i mean i think that you know if someone's just because it's also at the same time a past expression of how certain people are as well because i've known people that have had tattoos and they regretted it but they at least having to show that like the story of their life or the scars that they've had um to at least let people know something about them um so I, again it I would suggest that it's not necessarily something to get someone kicked out of a church over. Um, but know. that's, that's also kind of like the problem is that when the, the way to deal with that thing, that's technically permissible, but it might bother some people. Well, right. the only solution that they ever had was to ban it from being seen lest the people of, uh, lesser character, I guess, even though they were treated as the people who were running the church, as the people who were unable to deal with things like long hair and tattoos, are dictating the policy of the church. So even though it's not technically against the church rules, it de facto becomes part of the church rules. And that kind of becomes a death spiral because so long as you can object to something that is within the purview of uh, whatever the church rules are, you can basically dictate what the rules are without anybody ha else having a say in it. Mm -hmm. And that, that was like one of the major reasons that I, I said, I have like a 95 theses. It was like another one of the major reasons is that, well, all things are permissible and all, not all things are beneficial. I, I think I remember that's how the verse goes. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that's a, yeah, that's first Corinthians six is where that is. But it's like, they acknowledge that all things are permissible. Not all things are beneficial, but they don't actually end up treating things as permissible because they're not beneficial enough to the people who want to dictate that church policy. And right. Well, never know. I mean, to me, my only thing is, and I am encouraging this movement is that with people, especially since the release of John MacArthur's uh, book um, about the, that basically the more of the churches today need more of a reformation than, we ever do and there's a i've even tried showing a pamphlet from ernest reisinger uh pretty much with the same kind of layout and thesis um to mm -hmm. my pastor about it on reforming um a local church basically how to do so um because i think that if something happens that we are finding uncomfortable or finding in compromise to certain biblical principles then we definitely need to um, get those issues addressed um, in the same way, like you mentioned, put your own kind of like 95 thesis on the door of the, the church. And so I think this would, I don't know, just, just a suggestion in case you either still that might want to go back, but with an intention of uh, changing or reforming, or unless you have decided to um, find somewhere else that would 
be of a much more say uh, better atmosphere in regards to that. Mm -hmm. um, but getting back to the to the issue, um, so as you mentioned, the person this was about an issue about you shifting to adult art. Um, now, when you say adult art, because I've noticed that technically there is like some nudity, but there's like not there's no um, what's the lack of what's the word I'm looking for um, the the shaft or the um, dots that you would see on the chest area. I, I think I could say that without some people that watch this uh, <laughs> not knowing what it means. Uh, would would you say that it uh, that it would contain those and some of them? You lost me at some point. I, I, I like, no, like, okay, I guess I'm, I'm, I'll just try to say, because I mean, we've covered some crazy stuff on the channel before. So if anyone has watched this before, I mean, you have nobody but yourself to blame, folks. Um, so when it comes to, to some of the adult um, artwork that you have shifted to, does some of the material contain um, a penis and, a, and nipples and vagina being viewed in a display because i've seen where sometimes you don't have them they're just like fur that is like over the areas and it's no depiction of any sexual form but is there somewhere that is some sort of like nipples and penis that is depicted yeah okay so just want to make sure that uh oh because there's different ways some people have tried to articulate what they mean by adult art in some ways so i just want to make sure that i understand what what, how you would define it from your perspective, from your own words. Um, okay, so with that being said, I mean, so is that by adult art then, is then with those depictions being then there, is it just that, okay, we're seeing some of this or is there anything pornographic going on? Well, I haven't necessarily drawn anything or displayed anything pornographic. Mm. So, but at the same time, for storytelling purposes, since that's kind of the thing that I want to do, I don't necessarily rule out human sexuality as a part of that because human okay. sexuality is a part of life. Right. So, but you would say that you, like, you wouldn't, like, find this, like, say, for, I'm sure, because there's some sites, the only ones that I can think of in terms of the furry world, thanks to, um, of course, fur the furry degenerates that I am friends with. Uh, then again, I can't really say much about that myself since I am technically part of that uh, community. So I had nobody but myself to blame. Uh, but besides my friends, there's also Twitter that points out um, E621, I guess is the name of this site. Um, and uh, whatever, some websites that may have the word YIF in it. Um, like you wouldn't find the these web these uh, websites to be like the main distributors of some of this uh, stuff. This would be just like on what you're doing and it's not to be viewed in the same way that some of those other ones like E621 and all these others have, but it's how you're carrying out just to tell a story for the most part. I say just to tell a story is like, that's a little bit disingenuous. I mean, right. storytelling is definitely like my primary, uh, day-to-day -day motivator is that I want to get that across and at the same time there are times where I'm like well today the story is that I am incredibly frustrated and sometimes when you are incredibly frustrated looking at naked people uh, feels nice uh, and that's as far as it manages to go and <laughs> all right like, if, if we're gonna be completely honest here it's like sometimes it just be like that <laughs> well yep i mean i've known that's one of the things i've struggled with uh in the past um so let's so let's touch on that then so so the one of the motivators that would go behind when you are drawing a scene is that there's a frustration then that's going on there uh, sexually in terms of the tension yeah Okay, so, because it's like, as you said, one day you're this, and then one day if you're having something, then that's sort of what inspires then the next uh, strip um, for the scene to be then drawn into as you shift into the story. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, 
so when you talk about then that you're going about just telling the story, but occasionally having that, it's not that it's mostly sex that is being in this. Like, it, like I guess then this would be an easier question. If you were to put a percentage ratio um, concerning your the story that's in, actually involved in comparison to the the sexual stuff that happens, what would be the ratio um, that we're looking at in that? Right, for for most any given story, um, the actual sexual ratio is probably not going to break 5%. Um, there's a lot more drama that goes on than just sex. And I'm not particularly interested in uh, just telling a story where uh, – characters have sex and that's it uh but also at the same time it doesn't particularly mean much to me if somebody else wants to do that because that's just a uh, different uh way that they want to approach it right uh you know my particular way that i want to approach it is basically uh telling a dramatic story first mm -hmm. and just two characters having sex is, does not really make itself a dramatic story. So, <laughs> right. So you would, so I don't know, would you then have like a, uh, like, I, like, I understand what you're saying. Like you would technically have no problem with other people like drawing or taking their thing. Like I would with people going about doing their things, but would you also at the same time have your own personal opinion or problem, uh, regarding that while still saying that, you know, you're allowed, uh, technically in terms of your will and your decisions to make these options like would you still have like your own kind of personal uh problems or struggles with uh someone deciding to take the more um 18 plus pornographic uh route in terms of uh animation or web or web comics i say, I, I used to have a problem with that like several years ago but it was like in in facing and recognizing what that what that actually means is that uh, it's an inter it was an internal problem with me. Like the reason that I ended up despising like uh, pornographic images by people I associated with was that kind of fear that it would reflect back onto me. Like if I'm associated with this person that does this this and that well what does that say about what does that say about me am i going to and this was like back when i was still part of the church and still trying to reconcile i was still trying to reconcile uh, my own self with that of the church and saying well the church wants me to uh convert all these people and i'm basically sitting here doing nothing about it so God is going to cast me into hell for actually knowing about all these people that do all this stuff and not uh, chastising them about it all the time, every single day of my life. And like, that's kind of a death spiral to uh, being uh, very, very unhappy with uh, your life. <laughs> So the worry was like if you were associated or uh, friends with a certain person, then that would that would be considered problematic to some, or yeah, it's especially since uh, since the other side of me recognizes that I actually enjoy this and do not necessarily find uh, any resulting issues with it um mm -hmm. like i can't i can't come up with a good justification for why uh a person standing there completely naked uh even if it is a slightly prurient interest sort of thing is like they are naked specifically so that you can ogle at them uh to right. a tiny degree at least or just at least accept that they are naked and the naked body is good looking and all that kind of stuff. Um, very difficult for me to actually find a justification that did not ultimately lead back to, well, God said not to do it. 
And that was always kind of unsatisfying to me because God could technically say a lot of things, but right. we it's very difficult to say for absolute certain whether or not God said this or that because the only way that we're going to know is if somebody else tells us. And if you know anything about world history, people can say that God said whatever they want him to say. Right. So that's that, not really that's not really a good argument for right. anything. Right, but that also doesn't just apply to uh to the issue of you know that God says this happened like you mentioned with history, we find this with like several figures with for example, we don't have any documents of what uh Socrates um uh did. The only thing that we have are people from uh, students of his as well as the students of his students like we've had people like uh, Aristotle and Plato um, so we have those people that would be sort of a given to where we get our understanding of uh, Socrates uh, from and where we get that and the same thing can then be said about um, Alexander the Great we technically don't have a document written by him during his period uh, we do have biographies of him, um, as well as some coins that do depict him and tell us some stuff. So we have information of a recording about um, Alexander the Great, but we don't have anything written by um, Alexander personally. And that's why there are some people that do even doubt the existence of Alexander the Great, even saying that, well, these people uh, only wrote about him and are biographers, not that... Were, we're not that much close to him. So how can we trust that what they're saying is reliable? Um, uh, that, that's kind of a very uh, exclusionary view of history because if you start going mm -hmm. down that road, then literally anything that's been written down uh, can't be trusted. Exactly. And because eventually you're going to go back to, well, I have to personally witness it myself before I can trust anything because anybody else in the world could be lying about what they say. It's like, mm -hmm. and that's not really a way that uh, investigative history goes because at some point you have to make at least tentative conclusions that you can maybe trust some of what's being said <laughs> instead of just assuming right out the gate that it's all lies. Right. And that's why I would definitely be skeptical of that approach of um, history, because this is something we find within that, plus Jesus mythicism, and even recently, uh, Muhammad mythicism, like people that have doubted the existence of Muhammad. Um, and not just from that, uh, like, Orientalist scholars, but uh, even Muslim scholars over in Germany um, that are pro professing the Shahada, that... Uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. But by the way, Muhammad didn't really exist. It's definitely an interesting perspective from these people on history, and I don't know how they come to these conclusions. But that being said, yes, I would agree that it's definitely something that, let's say, that we don't have certainty um, that God would say this and that, uh, or, or we don't know like that if he did or not. But concerning the issue then, would we then say that, I guess for you as a Christian, uh, would you say that the Bible um, holds some sort of authority or credence um, in terms of doctrine over your life? Oh, well, that also kind of depends on what you mean by authority. It's like, what, what ultimately is it that we are trying to take from the Gospels? It's that mm -hmm. Jesus... Jesus died for our sins, I guess. But even then, we have a difficulty understanding, okay, what does it actually mean to die for somebody's sins? Right. Because what, what was the purpose there? What's the point? Um, and you have to... That's kind of why it's critical to engage with the text rather than just... Right which is one of the problems I always have with my church is that, well, they already, they immediately tell you uh, what the answer in the text is. And mm -hmm. if that's not satisfying, well, too bad. That's the answer. Uh, but you kind of have to uh, try to engage with the text 
And you're going to fail to engage with the text accurately because uh, you are a person and you're not going to get it right the first time and mm -hmm. you're probably never going to get it right. Right. Uh, but it all comes back like to uh, certain foundational principles, not, not necessarily uh, loads and loads of doctrine. Right. <laughs> So like, when you say like the Bible, it, what is the Bible to mm -hmm. a Christian? And well, a lot of different denominations have had answers to different answers to that. Right. And it's like the one that I'm basically reacting to is uh, that the strangely recent one that people don't realize is recent of uh, absolutism in uh, biblical doctrine that says that uh, absolute literalism in biblical doctrine that says absolutely everything in the Bible happened exactly literally as it says it did. Right. But even then you still kind of question, okay, well, what do you mean by it literally happened that way? Because there's still interpretation that needs to be done. I mean, you can't just fall back on, well, this is literally what happened. And therefore we know exactly what lesson to take from what literally happened. It's like, that's not actually how that works either. Right. Because something else that literally happened would be like, I guess like uh, the assassination of John F. Kennedy that literally happened. What lesson do you take from it? It's history. You don't take a particular lesson from history because it's just things that happen. Lessons and stories happen after the fact. Uh, it's after the history happens that we make stories to make sense of it. But you can't point to the history itself and say, well, this is what it means. And um, that's, that's sort of, uh, or like going back, uh, Alexander the Great. Alexander right. the Great conquered a lot of the Middle East. Uh, what lesson do we take away from that? That's not really a story. That's just something that happened. <laughs> right. And that's why uh, I definitely would encourage people to like agree that we don't just simply accept certain interpretations that our certain churches uh, affirm. For example, I affirm uh, the statement of faith and the confession of faith from uh, two denominations, the uh, of course, the Baptist faith and message of the SBC that I'm a part, that is the Southern Baptist Convention, as well as the London Baptist Confession of 1689, which is what you'll find in most um, Reformed uh, Baptist churches today. Um, now, while they, they'll have their statements and faith, but they also say at the same time, especially if you go to the section about scripture or how they are to, or the preface about that specific thing or that, that specific uh, confession, is that it's about that while confessions can have an authority, they are not the ultimate authority. In other words, that if there is something that is in the confession uh, that you can find in scripture that is disagreeable with, uh, then go with what you find in scripture versus that with what you find in the confessions of the times, because scripture is the ultimate authority. And even the person that comes up with the principle of sola scriptura, um, and those who followed it, like Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, Theodore Beza, and various others, um, affirm the same principle that all confessions, church father citations, and all these others uh, must be tested by Scripture itself. Um, and that's why they then had created the what is known as the uh, historical grammatical method of hermeneutics, which that's one thing I have in a book. It's called Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics by Walter Kaiser and Moises Silva. And yeah, uh, uh, to to a like certain degree, I absolutely agree with like what those Reformationists were intending to do when they say sola scriptura is because uh, the church ended up dictating what the Bible meant to people, and they were like, no, people have to interpret what the Bible means for themselves because if they find something in the Bible that is not in line with what their local church says, well. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of the scripture that is correct and not the church because the church can 
be just as fallible as any person. But it's right. just sort of like over time, that idea of sola scriptura ended up being becoming church doctrine anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because all the churches say, well, our version of sola scriptura is uh, the one interpretation. And if you disagree, well, then uh, you should be immediately cast into hell. Um, it's like, yeah, that's, that's sort of like what, what happens with like a lot of reformations is that they start out with one very radical, even countercultural idea, and it eventually becomes part of the culture and softened until it is sort of uh, indistinguishable from what came before it. <laughs> and that's just like a fault of humankind. It's all it always really kind of goes like that. Right. So that being said, then I mean, cause I would agree that like soul scriptura, the idea that, you know, we go to the Bible and try to read and understand or exegete it, get it her and with our hermeneutics um, is to be done when we're trying to understand something, not just simply go with the tradition of the church. Um, but so, okay. So with regards to that, then, um, so when I still so earlier, you did ask like, what do I mean by authority? And basically like in terms of your personal faith, in terms of the way that you, of the things that you believe regarding that faith, um, would the Bible uh, and what it says um, have any, um, uh, you know, dictation over like, not in terms of like what you do or not. I'm talking about like, how you, uh, what you believe, basically. Uh, does the Bible have any authority in regards to that thing? Not like what you eat for breakfast and what then decides to go into dinner time, but like what, um, what your beliefs are. Uh, the, the specific beliefs that I've retained is uh, faith in God and Jesus as his son who came and died for our sins that we might have a hope in uh, heaven and an afterlife that uh, has conquered death, mm -hmm. which is a consequence of sin of uh, the world. But what all of those mean, what all those things that I just said mean, uh, I still feel like I'm under, I'm investigating uh, because a lot of those things the church says that there's something and I find the answer, if I find the answer uh, inadequate, then I say that uh, I go, then I would say that I would go forward and uh, investigate and try and find out something that at the very least seems like uh, it's a more complete answer than what it is like. Right. When we say that uh, the sin of the world is what causes death, you might take a few steps back. It's like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. God created the world, so why is there sin in it if God is perfect? And that's like one of those really basic things that you need to contend with is why did a perfect God create an imperfect world? And it's kind of that uh, you need to figure out what you understand about God and not necessarily what everybody says that God has to be. Uh, because I, I like taking a philosophical approach to it because uh, philosophy is sort of, uh, uh, sort of about uh, rigor in uh, your ethics and what you consider to be moral and good. And as long as there's like a consistency there, then uh, it is kind of difficult to uh, argue against it. Uh, especially insofar as if you like look at certain church doctrine and you find that it's inconsistent, that it will say that you can't do this, uh, but you can do this. And when they say you can do this, the, ultimate results of it are pretty obviously worse than otherwise. I mean, 
I, I'm saying that in very, very broad terms that probably not even making sense unless I could like drill down to something specific. <laughs> mm -mm. Well, like, cause here's the main, the main thing, like, cause earlier you had mentioned about that you couldn't find any justification for why it would be wrong for someone to look at someone um, that isn't uh, somebody that they're married to um, in a fashion, depending on where, where the context is of it, like say um, strip club, some, something on Pornhub or something like that. Um, besides that the Bible says this, um, there are some uh, other arguments that have been made by that, that have not even been from a religious institution. I forget what, um, the uh, group is called, but they basically deal with uh, pornography and uh, do go with not biblical verses and how they go to presentations and everything, or even promote the gospel or anything. But it's all like that scientifically and medically proven that pornography, um, the, those who view it, are then put into an addiction based off of things that go on within the dopamines within the brain. Um, that are triggered as a result and that um, it gets them addicted to the point that others have testified and shown from how these people have come about it. Um, have had basically it, how it's had a negative impact in their lives concerning uh, the time consuming um, that has done certain uh, increases in how these people act that it eventually causes them to act upon themselves in a more, well, they're trying to desire a, a certain high um, if you will, in terms of the uh, lust that they go after. Uh, yeah, well, okay. I've heard this one before. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that uh, anything that produces dopamine in the brain can have an addictive effect. Right. That is kind of like what dopamine is for. And the nature of addiction doesn't really have anything to do with the fact that there's a dopamine hit in the brain. Otherwise, we would have to like equate... Uh, that dopamine addiction with anything with like a, a sinful desire uh, mm -hmm. and th that because if it results in like this negative thing uh, then that and then we say well this this one negative thing which is uh, uh, lust uh, is right. sinful then all these other things that we can equate to it should also be sinful what's so special about lust Mm -hmm. uh, but the specific thing is that uh, the reading that I've done on addiction says that addiction is actually a lot more, has a lot more to do uh, with um, uh, your social standing and what well, has, has to do with, uh, I can't, I can't remember this. It was uh, uh a rat colony experiment where uh, rat, rats uh, were given uh, water with, I think it was laced with heroin, uh, but they realized that so long as the rats were already happy with their lives with this, within this rat utopia colony, uh, then heroin didn't really mean anything to them, and rats who were miserable with their lives in these uh, tiny little isolated cages really only had heroin to fall back on. And that's the nature of addiction is uh, that dissociation from a community and lack of support and love. And mm -hmm. it doesn't really have anything to do with the particular dopamine hit in the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. There's different aspects on how they approach it. Cause definitely there's not just one factor that's gone on to. In fact, I've learned from taking both a, a psychology course and then a sociology course that certain behaviors depend on, either what happens mentally within uh, the state of mind and the brain, um, as well as then certain sociological uh, factors that happen concerning the environment that someone grew up in, um, how uh, culture perceives a certain idea that this person is a part of. So there's all kinds of things, obviously, that we have to consider. I was just pointing out, what some of these other groups that are not going to the Bible for a justification to ending certain um, 
actions in, with regard to lust um, in that sort of way, but rather that they're going to other means. And as you I mean, as you pointed out, you said you've heard of this. This is not, this is not the first time you've heard these kinds of uh, uh, justifications or arguments. Mm-hmm. All right. Just, just so I just wanted to point that out there. Um, so, but other than that, when I I believe as Christians that. In terms of the Bible, it is authoritative in terms of the matters of what we believe in doctrine and practice of faith, as the uh, position has been concerning sola scriptura, concerning the um, fact that it is an ultimate authority, not in terms of like every single thing, because obviously then we're going to have some uh, weird understandings on how to institute political in- innovations, as such as the theonomists are trying to do, as well as, uh, you know, people that are trying to do like the whole, uh, what was it? The, the Daniel plan that says that, you know, that if you eat like Daniel and his friends did in the book of Daniel, uh, that you'll lose weight if you do it for seven days. But last I checked, uh, especially since I had got done reading the old Testament, uh, that that was actually, they did that and they got fatter. So not a really good weight loss thing. Once you actually read the whole story and apply some hermeneutics there, um, but that being said, so I would say that when we look at, uh, certain passages of scripture, like we had mentioned before, and you went to it as the first Corinthians six, where it says to, uh, you know, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Um, there's a part in there where, um, uh, Paul is addressing, uh, these people, um, about certain issues that are going on within the church. Um, and he points out in verse 15, know ye the, in fact, I'll use the uh, ESV here um, because I don't know what, what your preferred translation is, but I'll just use this one because it is a popular one today. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never, or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her for as it is written? And then of course it mentions Genesis with, uh, Adam and Eve, they knew each other, then the two will become one flesh, uh, reference of the of the Torah. And then it says, but he who is joined with the Lord becomes one in spirit with him. And then says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person uh, sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. So he points out that the reason why he's saying all this stuff is because of the reference that the body um, of somebody um, is a temple of the Lord and that we are to care for it in terms of what goes into, not just from food wise, but also concerning that um, the spiritual terms, which regards to um, certain sins like uh, hate fuel, basically like um, people that are watching stuff just so they can obtain hate, which that is considered a sin. It's considered murder um, from a, spiritual sense and then the same thing then goes into lust um with flee all just doesn't say like in terms of having sex with somebody but flee from sexual immorality which from the survey of how that specific word is used isn't is even identified in terms of like looking at someone with lust in the heart in terms of like what we see in pornography strip clubs when well, they, certain people participate in that i mean when you're talking about what uh paul means by with a prostitute that's also up to interpretation because since he's talking about the body as a temple right. and you're talking about uh, pagan cultural practices is where would you normally go to find a prostitute that would be at a temple right. and that is talking about sexual that could just be talking about sexual immorality as joining to a prostitute and becoming one flesh and uh, just being part of uh, this uh, temple that's not of God. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's bringing up prostitute and not just any other person. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that was the thing that I was coming up with was there's a lot of words especially in the new testament that uh get interpreted a certain way uh and we don't even necessarily have like 
a very specific idea of what it means other than uh, what the use of the word inside of the scripture itself means that it seems to mean that it is. Uh, and especially when you say sexual immorality, we have to like come up with this uh, idea of what morality means, but mm -hmm. we also kind of have to agree on what our basis of interpretation is. So right. like when we say, if we're going to go back to like what Jesus said and say, well, if you look at a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Well, what does, right. what did Jesus mean when he said that? Did he mean that uh, any kind of anger towards your brother is a sin that will condemn you to hell? Any kind of lust that you may exhibit toward somebody else will condemn you to hell? Or is he saying that the... Uh, or is he saying something else? Is he saying something like, is he saying something like, uh, all these activities are, you don't get a, you don't get a free pass just because you kept it tucked inside. It's like, that doesn't make you necessarily better than someone who actually acted on such things because you may be contributing to such things. That's correct. Right? Mm -hmm. it's like, so that doesn't actually necessarily condemn you to hell because we also don't have a basis for agreeing, well, what is sin and how does that relate to us and Christianity and how we understand what sinful nature is and is it like this list of things that we have to avoid or is it a state of mind that we have to keep in mind or what what specifically is keeps people from being condemned to hell mm -hmm. because when we look at the kind of stuff is i i I'm completely unprepared for any of this. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, no worries, man. Just relax. Like, I mean, just say what you feel is needs to be the truth here. I mean, so like, I guess how I would respond then is like, I agree. We have to understand what is meant by what Jesus and Paul says, because it's not just here. I mean, as you pointed out, Jesus says the issue of, look at someone with lust. And I think when we look at that exegetically as even, and I'm not talking about Bible pastors or Bible preachers. Um, I'm talking about uh, scholars, like people that have studied at PhD university um, level, like one of them that is on Matthew, that is a very, um, very well researched and is considered the leading uh, Matthew scholar of the gospels. Um, and I'll be happy to send you a free copy of this, uh, in PDF format because it's because you know how much chapters that Matthew is it's a 28 chapters but this commentary is a thousand pages of pure going into the details of rather it's the history of things the specific Greek words uh, the full-on context that is going on with everything as well as um, even going into the details of its citations of the Old Testament um, so it's a very well done thing and from what i would recall from uh rt france in his uh commentary on this is that he essentially points out that it is indeed referring to that of lust in the same way that how the jews um in the torah viewed it except jesus um according to france uh goes a much step further than the pharisees and the jews back then who would say that um it's not really that bad to look at someone else with lust in your heart. Um, it's mostly if you engage in the actual sexual practice um, that the Torah forbids, that it would become um, a sinful problem. Whereas Jesus uh, says, you know, tries to take it a step further, like he does with the whole 
um, hatred passages. Like he says that, you know, if you hate someone, that's the same as committing murder. And then he takes it a step further this time by pointing out that it's basically the same thing. You may as well be fornicating and having sexual relations if you do look at someone with a lustful intention, no different than hating someone. Uh, and I think the main reason he focuses on this is because of most other sins, is that the issue of a motive. When someone decides to commit murder, like in the same way that Cain killed Abel, when he murdered him, there was hatred that was in that, in that heart of his. And then the same can be said for other cases when we do a survey of what was the motivation to hide most of the murders, that there was like an intent of before hatred. And that's what ultimately tries to get to that uh, carrying out of that execution. And then the same can be said then of lust. And this is, of course, only towards people that aren't married because we see elsewhere that jesus has no problem um saying that you know lust and carry after people that are um who you are married to so we have to consider the entirety of what jesus himself and his own teachings say in context of the rest of his teachings well yeah that's be like you can point back to well, jesus says that the motive is just as bad as the action but did he also mean that any given motive is as bad as any given action or is he specifically trying to uh, address like uh, certain certain ways that the pharisees were thinking like sort of like uh uh like this common joke that keeps going around that is actually a thing that some people do right uh, that say well i I could still be a virgin. It doesn't count if uh, my boyfriend uh, does me in the butt. Um, right. Yeah, because be li be like you could say like that's like a very specific motive, but that doesn't necessarily condemn all ness all motives. Like <laughs> like maybe like maybe the motive. Uh, like maybe the motive is just completely misplaced. Um, it's like the, the, this obsession with having to uh, remain virginal uh, is leading you down a path where you have this increasingly bizarre series of uh, justifications uh, to the point where you end up in like this certain place where you're, actually essentially carrying out the thing that you say that you're avoiding but because you are following the letter of the law you can say well we didn't actually have sex with huge air quotes around it <laughs> and that's like that's like an obvious hypocrisy that would necessarily be applicable to uh what's being said there mm -hmm. And it's like, you, you can point to that and say, well, that is, you can, and even if like you didn't even necessarily say having sex with your boyfriend is bad, you can still say that's a hypocrisy that you need to get rid of because it's absolutely ridiculous and stupid. <laughs> uh -huh. So the hypocrisy is that someone having, okay, so like run that by me real quickly again like the hypocrisy would be but the hypocrisy would be saying that so long as all of my sex with my boyfriend is indirect uh -huh. then i'm not violating the letter of the law mm. and that's not even getting into the question of whether the law itself is correct but we are still talking about a hypocrisy that's resulted in a very ridiculous situation. Right. Okay. So that would kind of be definitely problematic there then definitely. Cause to me it's even cause it's cause I don't see how that would reason would follow is that as long as they aren't, cause some people think that that's what you need to do is to penetrate in not the butt, but the vagina to be considered the actual act itself because um, they were still engaging in anal sex and that was still considered fornication even in terms of the uh, boy prostitutes that they would use for Baal worship and in Canaanite worship that was being done with the shrine temple prostitutes 
is that so we have those obviously as being instances and that was considered still fornication um but when it comes to the fact that you know the text itself points out you know pornia fornication um, adultery and all these terms and points out that the looking of it there seems to then be this sort of motive that goes not it could be of anything that it goes on because it's not just one specific um, thing that goes on it's not like um, I just want to have frustration to relieve myself or anything like that there's also um, maybe the person just wants to please the woman or guy depending on the context there um, maybe the person wants to um, help out um, maybe the person just wants to shoot some kind of art form but still has some sort of arousing from it um, so I don't know so um, these are some questions that we definitely have to ask uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff um, so I want to quickly because we don't have much time left uh, on the show want to cover um, one more thing um, I think it is that you mentioned something um, about the Gospels when it comes to the issue of uh, what I had what else was uh, brought about um, f- at least from what I gathered in the conversation is that there was also some doubts or problems about uh, certain New Testament things like this person had mentioned that you seem to think that only the gospels are scripture, whereas the rest aren't, um, Uh, or the, it depend depending on what you mean by scripture, it's all scripture because it's all been written. Right. The, the point is what is authoritative in what way? Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to say that, anything about Christianity is authoritative, then you first go back to uh, Jesus Mm -hmm. because that's kind of the foundation of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So then the question is, what what is Paul in relation to Jesus? Paul is an apostle of Jesus. He says as much. So the question is, were the apostles of Jesus fallible? Right. Because they were men. Mm-hmm. And they occasionally even admit as such that uh, they, especially Paul, when in his early letters, he has certain opinions that in his later letters, he says, but, you know, sometimes I wasn't really, I don't think I uh, said this correctly, or I don't think that uh, this thing that I was all about in my earlier years uh, is necessarily even a thing or he gets grumpier about some things and it's like uh, I, I used to be permissive about this and now I'm saying no I don't really think I don't think I approve of any of this or any of that kind of stuff mm-hmm. um, and it's like Paul is so that's like that situation is that Paul is a man he changes his mind and does that mean that does the fact that his words are in the New Testament mean that his decrees are binding? Mm-hmm. That is the question when we're asking, is it scripture? Or at least in uh, certain denominations, we're asking, is it uh, God breathed? Or did are all the words of Paul that exist in the Bible right now uh, absolute fixtures of things that cri- you need to believe in order to be a Christian. And it's like, like part of my problem with that was always, uh, we kind of have a lot more words of Paul than we do of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So it's right. kind of, it, it starts to be a little weird that, uh, when we say we're a Christian, but we're largely following the words of Paul. Right. Right. This is actually something that I heard about one time from a. Uh, he had another name before then, but now he uh, calls himself a uh, uh, Yeshua Evans. I believe is what he's uh, goes by now. He's a a, a 
a Muslim doing dawah. And at one point he says that he wants to basically say that true Christianity is following the red letters uh, versus the black letters um, of the Bible. Um, the interesting thing to note is that even then the red letters are just guesses and speculations. Like, for example, there's um, doubt um, as to whether Jesus says anything from John 3.16 onward um, because we don't really see anything that sounds like it's carrying onward to his discussion. And it does sound more along the lines of John's own words and his own vocabulary rather than the vocabulary of his recording of Jesus. Um, so there's debate as to whether those should be red letters or black letters. And even then the red letters of Jesus says to listen to uh, and obey those of his apostles. Um, so therefore then the black letters as well, which is of Paul, John, Peter, depending on which, uh, one wh which, which verse are you saying to about that one? Because I, I remember uh, Jesus telling his apostles at one point, uh, whatever you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Is right. That's, that, mostly th that's a thing that you're referring to. Well, that, not that that's actually in reference to um, them going out and evangelism because that's been given to uh, P Peter, but it's also been given to the other disciples and it's reference in context is in reference to um, the issue about, uh, you know, them opening the gates of heaven and closing the gates and the issues of binding and loosing is of people that they preach the gospel to and administer the gospel to, which just simply shows a uh, command of obeying, um, you know, the word of God in terms of the gospel and telling them to, for according to Jesus, his command for the great commission it still carries out even then before Matthew chapter uh, 28 and, depending on if you accept the textual variant or not, Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're well, also talking, even then when we're talking about like uh, Jesus saying that you have to listen to the apostles is because uh, Jesus was going to be gone. Um, and the actual text of the gospels didn't get written down for a very long time. It was, passed on orally so you didn't really have any choice but to listen to the apostles right because or anybody who any of the apostles who carried with them the story of jesus um so that's also like sort of uh obvious to a certain point uh it still doesn't necessarily mean whether uh any further decrees of the apostles are therefore binding as doctrine because and but also even the other thing is like you have if you have to listen to the red letters the black letters still give context to the red letters and right. we put even more black letters in the form of con commentary to give more context because we're displaced from uh, the actual events by 2000 years so we need even more context so we're really only ever going to see we're we're trying to uh, peer through a mirror darkly at this and try and uh, pull out the meaning of the context of words that have been displaced and possibly in some circumstances not even written down. And to a certain extent, that still kind of always falls back on every person's individual judgment as it goes. And as far as that goes, uh, Paul is at a certain point still just a man, especially uh, at the point he says that he wishes he didn't go to preach to a certain church because uh, then they started calling themselves followers of Paul. And he, right. uh, he, he has a problem with this because he doesn't like it when people say, oh, I'm a follower of Paul, I'm a follower of Apollos, I'm a follower of uh, whoever. And everybody is supposed to be a follower of Jesus. Right. It seems like we just sort of solved that by making everybody a follower of Paul so that we don't have to say, and then say that Paul is equivalent with Jesus so that we don't have to say that we're followers of Paul. 
Right. That's normally what I usually get a, as an accusation a lot by some Muslim apologists is that you don't follow Christ. You you actually follow Paul. Paul invented Christianity. Jesus. I wouldn't say Paul invented Christianity. If uh, Paul invented a lot of Christianity, it's, but uh, there's also like some parts of Christianity that we consider sacrosanct, like uh, the Trinitarian doctrine, saying mm -hmm. that God is uh, three parts. Even the Church of Christ uh, takes part in this doctrine, despite the fact that it did not actually appear for about a hundred years until I believe it was a uh, Tertullus who uh, first wrote down the uh, Trinitarian doctrine to uh, say that, well, uh, you have to believe that uh, God is three people and anybody who doesn't, he basically said anybody who doesn't believe this is stupid and an idiot. Uh, he was not, he was a very blunt writer. <laughs> right. Well, well, the thing is that that speak. It's fun. It's interesting that you mentioned that because there's a a video that was actually recently done by a friend of mine, uh, Rob of Sentinel Apologetics, that uh, talks about that you actually have the Trinitarian formula um, even before Tertullian. Um, you have it in like the the late first century document of the Shepherd of Hermas. Um, you may have it. Uh, I I don't. I wouldn't say like Tertullian invented the trinitarian doctrine it probably got it from somewhere and it's been was floating around but right. it otherwise doesn't actually appear in the bible except by inference and a lot of that inference was sort of written in later it's especially like some of those uh are you disputed, talking about like first like, john 5 7 yeah there's some of yeah some of those uh, disputed uh passages where they say like the father the son and the holy spirit mm -hmm. and it was like, and given like uh, how, the way that uh, the documents were written, it looks like it was uh, written in the sidelines by a commentator that was then incorporated into the text. And it's like, right. so it's like, it's not, there's not really all that much evidence for uh, the Trinitarian doctrine except by inference inside of the Bible. And some people take that as a reason to scrutinize the Bible incredibly hard in order to draw out more and more doctrines from it. Mm -hmm. right. And it's like, and that's their reasoning for it. But so what like, about, I, so like, what about a uh, Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, where it says, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the father and of the son and the Holy spirit. That's just good rhetorical form, isn't it? Three things, <laughs> right? But it's using it because no, notice what the what how what the command is is that baptizing them, and remember this goes to remember how baptize, baptism was from John the Baptist. We're we're getting this mirror uh, institute at, and to do so, baptizing in the name of you're calling upon something that is uh, considered sacred and holy, and based on what we do know of Jesus. Um, and his references to the father, obviously when we say father, that's God being included there. So if anything else is uh, not but, God. But, about, but it's also the thing that we only <coughs> sort of have an understanding of what the Holy Spirit even means, because mm -hmm. it only has like two direct actions within the gospel. And that is uh, during the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes down. And uh, then uh, the tongues of fire, uh, during the Pentecost is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And none of that necessarily means that the Holy Spirit is necessarily part of God, but we treat it as part of God because the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the same phrase as God, even though the Holy Spirit mostly seems to have something to do with baptism. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, the issue, well, I would, of course, depend on how you view, because again, like the Church of Christ does kind of teach the issue of like a baptismal regeneration uh, doctrine, which I would disagree with. Um, so when it comes to, but again, this is one of the, those formulas where we do have that um, concept being taught there um, about this sort of Trinitarian form, because when he says, again, calling upon something, baptizing in the name of, that's giving holy credence. And obviously we know that 
uh, you know, Jesus and the others weren't, you know, polytheists or believed in some sort of a shared hierarchy of uh, what is holy that then gets included in some sort of worship or give credence to. Um, they were strict monotheists. And when they say something that says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you're baptizing in that specific, in this, those specific names, as if they are holy and therefore divine, um, in the same way as it points out to the Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit then being included in this, it seems to indicate logically that this would be a Trinitarian formula. And in fact, the early church fathers point out that this was how they get the Trinity even before the addition of First John 5, 7 in early um, in later manuscripts. But it's also like the only one that's there. Well, there's because the other one that the first, the, uh, most of the references to there being three parts were in later manuscripts. And the fact that they are in later manuscripts kind of means that there are earlier manuscripts that did not include it that way. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't just happen that it appears in the manuscript. Somebody wrote it in and mm -hmm. people who write it in generally have ideas about how it's supposed to work like that. Now, mm -hmm. But did they write in later on Matthew twenty eight nineteen with the formula? With Matthew twenty eight nineteen, I am I am not familiar if they did. But uh, if the early church fathers got it from Matthew twenty eight nineteen, then it was probably written down that way. And if it was written down that way, it was said that way. But just because it was said that way doesn't mean it was meant that way. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And that's why I, I try to give an exegesis of it based off of certain words that are being utilized, which is why I tried to point out the emphasis that it's talking about the command to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, which focusing on that word goes back to the language utilized in the baptism of Jesus and the rest of the stories about John the Baptist whenever he was baptizing people. And in the name of, which whenever we see that, it's usually, especially since the Father's included in this, we definitely know from Jesus' own words and Jesus' own ideas that this is supposed to be God in mind here. And therefore, to say something in the name of anything else that is besides God or matching it up with God is to try, that isn't God, by the way, is to ultimately be something that's saying something that is holy, but in reality is not. Or something that is divine that in reality is not. But yet we see that the Son and the Holy Spirit are, cons are included into this in a triune formula of fa Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this particular formula. So, I mean, if there's a different way that we should understand this exegetically, I, I'm definitely open to uh, interpretation on. Okay. And mm, my perspective is that it doesn't necessarily mean anything. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean anything because if you're just going to pull it from a single way that it has was written down from an orally stated tradition, uh, then necessarily you would have to apply that sort of scrutiny to every single verse in the entire Bible. And some people do that and they end up coming away with, uh, incredibly harmful doctrines right so it's like that's why i'm 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 not very high on like incredibly specific word scrutiny specific mm -hmm. because as i as I say, uh, the Bible was written down by men and men are fallible. Right. Um, even if the scripture is God breathed, uh, there's literally nothing stopping any one person or some people from putting in something or adding in something or for the council of Nicaea who decided what, uh, the Western tradition of the Bible would consist of 
from including something that probably shouldn't have been included just because they invoked the Holy Spirit when they sat down to vote on the issues. Um, they basically included into the Bible anything that wasn't in extremely controversial with the large body of the council, but that also doesn't mean that uh, there are things that they decided not to include that could have been included because other uh, Christian, other Christian faiths have uh, have a different canon for the scripture. Um, so it's like <clears throat> that sort of level of scrutiny uh, is. I I feel like in some cases it might be helpful, but it's not quite as helpful as trying to uh, read it for the uh, bigger picture message rather than the really tiny details about it. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I, I don't think we probably don't have any time to get into this. It's just like, uh, like uh, the very modern doctrine of the rapture. Right. There's definitely a, I would agree that there, the concept, like for example, the left behind is definitely more of a modern uh, concept. And there's plenty of modern uh, books that have come out today that sort of uh, go against it. In fact, there was even one that was uh, talked about by N.T. Wright um, that goes over that this is definitely something that is new and you won't find this from um, earlier uh, traditions about how these perspectives of uh, the end times or there'd be, it's not like any of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And it's like, because it's like, uh, <coughs> there's all these traditions of like super hard scrutiny to the point where uh, you start, these people start piecing together this and that and that and that and say, Oh, it all makes sense. And they have like their uh, red yarn up on the wall between all these different verses and saying, I have figured it out. The world is going to end on October 21st, and then it doesn't happen. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> Funny enough, my in, our, in my community, they we call it the Great Debate Community because we get involved in these religious discussions uh, from various backgrounds. Um, but there was a guy that was involved there that called himself a a prophet of God, and he claimed that the world was going to end. I think what was it? Uh, I want to say last year or the year before that um he comes out and starts saying things like that you know he sees that the world's going to end on this day he's also cl claimed he's had visions of f that he, whenever he talks to god um god's revealed to him that i'm actually an atheist pretending to be a christian just so that i can make christianity look bad i don't know why that would be something he bothers wanting to ask him but okay um so his prediction where he even claims that by the time we get there, uh, we'll be living eternally and we will forever train in the style of Dragon Ball Z with where Goku and training up mm -hmm. on King Kai's planet. Uh, like he pictures that's what's going to happen in heaven. So day comes, doesn't happen. So obvious problem there because he had no real justification other than he had emotions as well as he was, um, a psychotic stalker for some individual chick, and that's where he was trying to kind of cast the, sh the the shadows from there at that point. Um, but yeah, you've seen it all over from uh, what was it, uh, John Hagee and uh, the his blood moons, as well as various other people with Y two K, which not just the Y two K that was going on from most Christians, even the cult group that's gotten a uh, a recent trend known as the black Hebrew Israelites. Um, they originally claimed that in the year 2000, uh, black Jesus was going to come down and kill all the white people. Um, and the, therefore all the whites are then going to be the slaves uh, to the, to the African Americans, the Hispanics and the native Americans in heaven, and that they will be whipped and treated badly, just like in the transatlantic slave trade. Like, but there's really no justification for knowing the future. Even the Bible says this. No man will know the hour when the Son of Man returns. 
So yeah, there, there's and there's like a lot of things like that. Is like you you take the scripture and you go down the rabbit hole, and you have clearly violated something that was stated pretty plainly somewhere else. Right. It's like so. It's also like is like sort of what I mean with the Trinitarian doctrine. You have like this one section that says uh, th these three are the same being and the entire rest of the Bible says that the Lord your God is one Lord. Right. And so there's a whole bunch of hoops that you have to jump through in order to get three to equal to one. And at the end of the day, does it actually matter? <laughs> That's, that's what I'm. That's what I really ask. What do you, what right. do you mean by three equals one? What does it matter? What kind of heresy is being committed when you say three equals one, or when you don't say three equals one? And how does that actually affect our ultimate morality and message? It's like try. Then it's like the, a lot of the early church history was. Uh, predicated on all these really stupid doctrinal arguments that ended up in actual wars. So it's, I feel like that's just something that is kind of best avoided. <laughs> well, I mean, go, going to your, the one thing that you mentioned about the issue of like, well, the Bible says that it includes that, um, that there's only one God and that the Bible talks about a three and one as three persons in one God. So there's still that idea of there still being a one God. And in fact, even as understood by that meaning of three and one, there's even academic uh, Jewish scholars, not simply from uh, Jewish uh, uh, schools, but even from like, uh, I believe it's uh, Yale university kind of uh, Jews as well. Like uh, you have uh, Benjamin Somers, um, uh, what's his name? I forget. He wrote the Two Powers in Heaven, which is the popular book that uh, talks about this. Is that even back then some Jews had differing views? Like some believed in the two and one that there was not a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah, they, I know. I know this one. It was uh, right. there's like a theory that a lot of the early Torah was referring to uh, a dual God system that was eventually completely rewritten in favor of a one god system mm -mm, no this is this is different this is like talks about like when you see terms like the metatron or the oh, angel the, the metatron god. yeah I, I know that one too okay right so and the, like what, the, but there's like several different perspectives that you take exa that. exactly exactly and i was like uh what even benjamin Somers' point was that while you have that two in one view you had somebody that would affirm a three in one. And then you had those of the Kabbalah section of Judaism, where they believed that concerning the Sufi row, um, like all that stuff within the Jewish mysticism, that there would basically be like them 50 points. They basically then believed to go higher of a 50 in one uh, God in terms of not a triune Trinity, but something of a 50 in one. And then some goes higher even to 100 in one. So there were multiple different Jewish perspectives where they still wrestled with uh, passages in the Hebrew because the Hebrew uses the term that our God is one Lord, where El it is Elohim being a plural uh, term, yet the term that is used for Yahweh, Lord, um, is used in a singular. So how then do you come to wrestle and understand the fact of a plural being used in reference to the title of something that is at the singular in reference to who God is? And that's what these G early Jews had tried to understand and offer these different perspectives. Um, so it's easy to understand and get the idea of a three in one aspect, but how we can even come to a three in one can be the same way of how we have something that's even beyond the 3d dimension. Like we're familiar with the 2d and we're familiar with the 3d um, dimension. Um, but there's also that which could be beyond that. And an example of this, I uh, forget, uh, there's actually the name of it is in the Marvel movies. Uh, what was that blue cube that uh, that Loki? The Tesseract. Was yeah, the Tesseract. That is an actual name for a what is a considered a hypothetical fourth dimensional shape of a cube that has um, 
basically double the amount of what we would find in a regular three-dimensional cube. And so it is predicted to be within the fourth dimension, and it has a lot more angles and perspectives than what we can perceive um, within our own ideas. And a great example of this was even illustrated by Carl Sagan within that regarding to two-dimensional and three-dimensional, where if you take someone that's like a little piece of paper that's cut out and he's in his two-dimensional world, and here comes the strange foreign object of the three-dimensional world, which he used an apple for his uh, thing. And he can't see anything that because he can't look up because he's in the two-dimensional world. And he can only see what's on the ground. And when the creature then reveals himself on the ground, he can't really make him depict out much other than what he's able to see and understand from his own uh, perspective in his own realm. And so I think the same thing can then be said with regards to the Trinity is that while we can say that it seems something that is definitely complex to say that there's three and one, even though we can say that this of the of various different things as usual um, with analogies, there's also the idea that maybe that's what we need is the fact that the statement and allowing this to be God that is not, basically he's not part of this uh, world. He created this world and he's beyond this uh, particular universe and existence and dimension. And so there's more to him that we probably don't, like the Bible doesn't even probably reveal everything that we need to know about God. Um, that's why there's a chapter in Deuteronomy where it says that the secret things are with the Lord, but that which is revealed for us to know is written within scripture concerning uh, God and the things of his. Um, so there could be much more to God that we don't even know that scripture ever told us about. So well, there obviously is. Oh, yeah. I mean, because that's also like one of my problems is that when you reduce God to the entirety of him can be understood through a single work of literature uh, that kind of makes him quite small when he's supposed to have created everything. And that's why like, there's also like a lot of, uh, also like a lot of uh, people throughout the history who said, okay, well, God created everything. Therefore I worship God by, learning to understand his world and learning to understand all the things in the world. And that's sort of where uh, the, at least the European side of the scientific revolution came from is, uh, is a desire to understand the things of God. Uh, but there's also like the other perspective that uh, you shouldn't look at, you shouldn't uh, try and record the, things of the world because that would make it in that would uh take something that's perfect and put it into an imperfect form uh that's like one of i think that's like one of the one of uh the muslim uh perspectives on it why uh certain muslim traditions uh say you can't actually depict anything natural and that's why all their art is like uh, geometric designs and things like that right Hmm. Well, this has definitely been an interesting conversation. I will say that much. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've gotten over to your artwork, um, the story of how you got into the furry fandom, as well as how we've got, have you gotten to the comics. And of course, a good theological discussion to follow up with it to uh, be the nice, uh, gigantic uh, pineapple on the pizza. Yes, I like Haw Hawaiian pizza. Get over it, folks. You can come and fight me later. All right. But I'm just going to say it right now. Pineapple pizza is the best pizza to ever be invented. No questions asked. Anyways, that being said, um, I do want to say uh, before we end, I um, and I hope you don't mind because uh, you know I don't know if you'll have time, but at least say that they'll be in your inventory. Um, do want to because I have some PDF format stuff, and I want to um, offer those to you uh, when the when the show's over. If you if you're okay with that, it's a a book that's. Uh, on the on the concept of the Trinity by a guy that I view as a very well respected uh, scholar and apologist on the the Trinity, um, as well as if I think if I have it um, in PDF, I'm gonna have to see what I have on it. Um, but it's another academic book on the issue of uh, writings on scriptures from a guy named D. A. Carson. If uh, otherwise, I would have linked you to the website where back then you were able to get his book 
uh, for like three ninety nine when normally it would have been uh, fifteen ninety nine. I don't know how in the world that sale managed to go on so long, but anyways, um, uh, just uh, you know, thank you for coming on, man. This has been a great privilege. Oh yeah, before I go, I almost forgot there was a someone because they uh, saw that I was doing this and they uh, it was someone that was wanting to say hello. Uh, wanted me to tell you that they said uh, hi and that they like your work. Um, let me <laughs> see. <laughs> yeah, get, definitely get your fans uh, involved. Uh, his name is Rippy. Um, R I P P Y. Okay. Hi, so. Rippy. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to you for your Rippy from uh, from good old good old Rick. Which, that's a good question. Uh, is Rick Griffin like an actual thing, or is that like Griffin as in like a play on words with like the Griffin animal? Uh, it wasn't intended like that. About to say because I'm like, <laughs> I, I just picked it because it sounded like a cool name at the time. Well, not to make this any more weird of an ending. <laughs> not to make this any more weird of an ending, but are you related to a Peter Griffin? No. Dang it! Well, I, I well, think yeah. I came up with the name before Family Guy was even on the air. Oh wow, <laughs> that's even bonus more bonus points. That's like they gotta give you royalties for like that or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Rick, this has been an honor uh, having you. So thank you for coming on. Um, thank you. Truly. Uh, and for those of you that have tuned in, uh, we will continue to try to do more of these theological discussions in the future. Um, as well as try to see how things turn out due to the fact that Google Hangouts is apparently shutting uh, down its work in the future. So we'll see how we carry things out. But until then, this has been RC Apologist. Take care.